Welcome to a brief video about the panel exam and how to prepare. I've created this video to augment the in-class session. So if you missed the session or you simply want to go back and refresh yourself on the content, that's the purpose of this video. But it doesn't replace being in the in-class session because, for example, it doesn't give us an opportunity to do some rehearsing or practicing of scenarios. Why is there a panel exam in our course? There are three reasons. The first is that we want to make sure that you review all of the material from the course and synthesize or connect it together. Rather than thinking about it as 32 individual modules, the idea is for you to make sure that you see it as one unified set of skills, knowledge, and principles. We also want to see that you can bring all of that material, all that knowledge to bear, even under a situation that reflects some pressure, because of course in the real world that will be common for you. And, of course, you'll be examined in a way that's very similar to the job interview process. So practicing for exams is also going to help you to prepare for being in job interviews once you search for work. The format of the exam is as follows. Each student comes in on their own and they are interviewed by three panelists. The instructor, me, is one of them. The other two will talk about where they come from in a later part of the video. Altogether, you'll be asked a total of six questions, and these questions come from lengthy, prepared lists of questions. Each panelist will pick two questions, and in total, that makes your six. Now, even though the panelists are picking two questions, all six questions are evaluated by every panelist. They score all of them. The questions come from rotating lists, and the panelists quick select their questions independently so that we can make sure we're not asking the same questions repeatedly and giving people an advantage because they might have heard a question from somebody else. So it's not only considered to be unethical for a student to share that information, typically it's pretty difficult for that to happen because there are so many questions and we rotate through them every day or every, sorry, after every interview. There may be follow-up questions and these are sometimes called prompts from the uh, panelists. Those do not count as one of your six questions. Those are questions that are just simply seeking clarification most of the time. Altogether, students typically spend about a half an hour in the room doing the question portion of the interview. It can be a little more or less depending on your needs and your pace. We don't time it. It's really about what you need. Altogether, the whole process usually takes about an hour. And that's because right after we've asked you the questions, We'll go through the process of scoring your exam and giving you feedback right away. That scoring process begins after your six questions. We ask you to leave the room while we score you and we begin calculating the score independently and then adding those scores together. Each panelist has the ability to award up to 10 points for each of the questions and the whole system is based on the ratio of two-thirds you need to get two-thirds of the points available on any question to pass that question. So when we put all of the, the panelist points together, there's a potential for 30 points and 20 is a passing mark. So if you think about it, that means that two sevens and a six would be a passing mark. And you're used to 70% throughout our course. So this is very similar. It's 66%, but very, very similar. So in other words, what we're essentially saying is you have to basically impress at least two judges and you have to get at least two-thirds of the points from them. You need to do that on two-thirds of the questions. You need four out of six to pass the test. So a 20 out of 30 passes a question and four 20s or better is what you need to pass the exam. We'll send you out of the room afterwards, as I said, and calculate your scores. Also, we'll talk about the results from a perspective of what feedback we think you deserve to get. And it can be good feedback, it can be feedback designed to help you improve, and it doesn't really matter whether you passed or failed, we'll give you that feedback either way because we want you to go into the workplace, really bring in the best of yourself. If you pass the exam, you'll be finished with your education with us. The only thing we'll be left to do will be to turn in your textbooks and get your textbook refund. If you do not pass, what happens is the panelists vote before you come back in the room on whether to give you a redo or a re-examination. That only happens after the first failed attempt and the panelists vote independently on whether or not to allow that. 
And if you come back in and you need a redo, we will work that out with you and tell you at that time. Some frequently asked questions. What are the prerequisites for the exam? First, all of your course fees and student fees must be paid. And you must have completed successfully all of your coursework, including nonviolent crisis intervention and class four licenses and practicums and so forth. If you failed a module earlier in the year, it's your responsibility to make sure that you've come to me to get remedial assignments and make sure that you've met the requirements to complete that work. And it will not be acceptable for it to be done on the day of your exam. Typically, we set that date about a week before the exams begin so that there's enough time for me to actually review your work and make sure it's at passing standard. Don't leave everything to the last minute if you're a person that has work that's left to be done. You do not need to bring your textbooks to the school before your exam, but you do need to bring them on the day of your exam and you'll turn them in after passing and get your reimbursement for your book deposit at that time. Can you bring anything with you? It's a smart idea for people to bring some kind of drink, coffee, water, whatever works for them, a blank piece of paper or booklet, something to write with, and a tissue if they want to. Sometimes people have the sniffles or they start crying because they're so happy or whatever, and it's important to have that. And if you want to have some kind of artifact, like a lucky uh, rabbit's foot or a picture of your kids, you're welcome to bring something like that, as long as you don't bring anything that might be helpful in the exam itself cannot bring any other person and that might seem obvious but we have actually had somebody who's asked to do that. You may not bring anything in that is already written whether it's something that you wrote such as uh, some mnemonics or something like that or anything that represents written material in the form of a textbook. Nothing like that. Your blank paper, you'll be asked to show that your paper is blank and you can't bring anything in that might help you. So you'll be asked to leave any bags outside any textbooks outside, your cell phone outside. When should you arrive? A really good barometer is to show up about 20 minutes early and um, that gives you time to take care of any kind of little needs like parking or bathroom trips and sort of mentally getting yourself ready. What you don't want to do is come there at the last minute and feel rushed and neither do you want to come for hours ahead of time and just sort of build up anxieties. 20 minutes seems to be the sweet spot for most people and I would encourage you to really Think about what you want to do in that time, whether it's going and finding a quiet spot and meditating or whether it's exercising, but just really kind of have a plan for yourself. You're not required to be there 20 minutes. That's a recommendation. What should you do when you arrive? Well, what you do is really up to you, but when it's your time to be called, you need to make sure that you're in the waiting area, which is typically the student lounge area. You will not be called early, so you don't need to be there five or 10 minutes early. You should be on campus someplace, but I promise you, you will not be called early. Um, you may want to sit with your classmates or sit on your own. It's really up to you. Everybody has their own preference, and I want you to do whatever keeps you kind of the most mentally and emotionally well. Who are the panelists? Well, as I've said, one of them is going to be me. The other panelists are people I've selected from the field, and these are folks who have direct line experience in community support work, educational assisting, or both. But they're also people who have leadership positions in their organization. They're supervisors. They have some role in interviewing, for example. Most of them these days are actually graduates of our program, and so the benefit of that is that they not only have experience as panelists, but they know what it's like to be the person on the other side of the table, to be a student being examined. And most of them have done multiple exams so that you're in pretty good hands. These are people who are comfortable with the process and understand what we're looking for. Can I choose or switch my time? No, you cannot. It's important to understand that if I allow one person to switch their time, then everybody else wants to do that too. It's just like any other college or university. They typically post when your exam happens and you need to be there on that date and time. So I will ask you to reply to me once I give you your scheduled exam time to confirm that you've got it and it's up to you to be there. I literally draw the names randomly and assign them to times to make sure that nobody has any kind of advantage. Some people love to go first. Some people hate to go first. I don't really have the opportunity to make that happen. It's really going to be as random and fair as possible. Now, the one thing that can happen is you might be sick on the day of the exam. And if that happens, you should do exactly what you would do on any other school day. 
call us before the day starts to inform us. And you will not be penalized if you're sick. And uh, what we will do is try to reschedule you if there's any chance to do that during that exam period. But that's not usually the case. So what will happen is we'll have to take a look at when you would next be able to take the exam based on the availability of the panelists and myself as well as yourself. We don't typically do that in July or August. So if you miss a June exam, you're probably looking at September or later, depending on um, what works for panelists. How should you dress on the day of the exam? Two words for you, professionally and confidently. So dress the way that you might for a job interview and dress in a way that makes you feel really good and comfortable with yourself. Make sure you follow the school dress code. It is just as important, if not more important on this day. I've actually had students who thought it was a good idea to change the dress code on this day and it's become an issue with panelists because they look at the professionalism of the students. And make sure your hygiene is on point because we're all going to be in a room together in relatively close quarters. And of course, sometimes people, when they get nervous, they start to perspire or that sort of thing. So make sure that you don't have to start thinking about your hygiene partway through the exam and having that unnecessary distraction. Another frequently asked question, I'm nervous, what should I do? Well, nervousness is what we expect to see. We understand it and you're not going to get evaluated negatively because you showed signs of nervousness. Some things that you can do to help prepare in a possible way, sorry, to reduce your nervousness in, in advance will be discussed in the in-class session as well as in this slide. But it's really important for you to plan to perform while you're nervous, to think about the fact that you're probably going to show signs of nervousness, whether it's breathing a little quicker or having sweaty palms and coming in mentally and, and cognitively prepared to deal with that is part of the whole process. Some important strategies, the simplest is to make sure that you really study the material so well that you have a high confidence level. And I would literally ask you to make a checklist as you go through studying things really scoring yourself and tracking how you do and getting feedback from people and scratch things off the list as you find yourself getting more and more comfortable. Practice under test conditions. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but make sure that you're not just studying by rereading or by getting written questions because that won't give you a sense that you can do it in the verbal, um, in the moment format. Make sure you take care of your self-care all throughout the process, but particularly on the week and the, especially the day or two before the exam itself. If you are a person that takes medicines or has other parts of your medical care, it's not less important but more important to focus on that during this time. I've seen students decide to stop taking their medicines or start, stop following their diet and it really came back to haunt them on the day of the exam. No cramming would be another thing I'd like to tell you. Do not study till late at night, particularly in the days leading up to the exam. You're not going to learn anything and you're going to take away all of your brain's ability to problem solve and communicate. Spend time with people who are really good for you as you get better and closer to the exam. That includes people like the, um, your classmates, of course. It also includes people who are in your social circle, your friends and so forth. Um, and stay away from people who are a distraction in your life, people who want to get you out socializing and promise them that you're going to be there for them after you get through this. Um, and of course, people who are kind of downers or negative in your life, try and sort of have them for a little while be um, a, a little bit less common in your life for the period leading up here as well. Find time for positive self-talk. Give yourself messages that um, are helpful and encouraging and take time to meditate, do yoga, or spend time alone, that dark room time, to really digest and, and, and um, think about where you are. Come prepared to use management strategies during the exam. So if you're a person with sweaty palms, come with Kleenex. If you're a person that gets a dry mouth, come with water. If you're a person that starts to stutter, then just simply telling people ahead of time, I might stutter. Um, if you need a fidget or you like to do breathing exercises, then come prepared to do those things. They're normal in the context of the exam and they impress the panelists when you, when you tell us that you want to use them. Control the room. And we talk more about this during the in-class preparation session, but there are specific things that you can do to slow down the pace of that process and really make sure you give time for your brain 
to digest the problems you're being presented with and the solutions you want to present us with. So slowing that process down and really giving yourself a chance to comprehend is a vital part of the process. And we'll talk more about that when we get together. And don't focus on being perfect. Focus on, focus on, on being effective. Focus on doing well enough to get through this. Every single person has something they could do better here. Every single person will have one moment that they wish they had done a little differently. And if you let that bother you, then it will get in the way of other questions. So don't be thinking about question one when you're on question two or question four. Just think about what you're working on in that moment and do your best. Who can I study with? Well, of course, you can study with current students. You may also find quite a few alumni who are willing to study with you, and I definitely encourage you to take them up on that. Your family and friends should not be overlooked as possible study partners. If you can get them to ask you questions from, uh, from cue cards, or they're willing to let you explain concepts to them in simple language, um, or they can help you to think of scenarios, those are all great, great ways to improve your communication. If you can explain it to lay people, good chance you really know it. And if you have colleagues, people that you work with, especially if you're already working in the field or volunteering in the field or on a practicum, and they are willing to ask you questions, take them up on that. Very few people you can't study with. If you know that somebody is going to be a panelist, don't ask them to study with you. And don't ask anybody or accept anybody's help if they're telling you a question that's been on a prior exam that has hurt people in the past because they came in memorizing content and judges could tell. Instead, come prepared to really problem solve. What can you use to study? Well, your notes, you should go back and make sure you have them organized over the course of the year, including notes on the modules. You can borrow notes from other people, including alumni, if they still have them. Be careful about using notes from people who are taking courses at other colleges. There's no rule against it, but they may not be very useful to you. The textbooks from the course can be useful, particularly chapters 1, 6, and 8 from Progress Without Punishment. Also, the purple book with Dr. Quackmore in it, and sections one and two of our Blue Green Competencies textbook are all worth rereading and making sure you understand. You may also want to go back and look at fact sheets or handouts prepared by other students over the course of the year. And of course, you should create questions within your study groups and use those. That's really one of the most important things you can do. There is no practice exam in this course. In the in-class session, I'll give you a few example questions, and then you can use those formats to create questions that you and your study group uh, uh, formulate. What are we looking for? The panelists want to see really a key thing, and that is evidence that you could effectively navigate these scenarios in real life, that we could trust that you would know what to do, even if it's not perfect. And that's why how you answers, answer matters as much as what you answer. You make sure that you're really clear and that you explain yourself well in language that shows you really understand these things in your own words. Give the thinking behind your answers, not just the what you would do, but the why. And it's really important to make sure you understand the question correctly. You're allowed to ask for it to be repeated. You're allowed to restate the question back. You're allowed to ask questions about the question if anything remains unclear. Make sure that you answer in a way that is focused and concrete, that describes what you would do, not just the values there or the general terminology. And don't try to dazzle us with big words or technical terms that you can't explain. If you use a term, expect somebody to ask you to explain it. People often ask me, what is the exam going to include? What material will it cover? And the answer is, if it was in the course, it can and will likely be in the exam. So for example, first aid, nonviolent crisis intervention, class four, food safe, work search, you name it, it can all be in the exam. Diagnoses, medicines, um, other agencies, these are all areas that people sometimes forget to go back and review. If it was in module 101, in anything since then, it can be in the course or in the, in the exam. The course looks for you to put those questions together, those pieces of information together in an integrated or synthesized way. It's rare for you to get asked a question that's just about one subject area. You'll probably have to bring 
the principles or ethics into the process. You'll have to think about specific skills like how to communicate or how to write or how to plan and also be able to describe the thinking behind it based on psychology, for example. Questions often ask you what you would do, but they really also want to know the why, the principles and knowledge. On average, you're going to have six questions over a half an hour, and so you can see that that means you're going to have roughly about a five-minute process per question. But notice it's not just five minutes of you talking, it's a process. So those five minutes include you being given the question, and not just getting the question once, but if you ask for it to be repeated, which is a really wise idea, that'll happen. Then Asking for time to think and taking a few moments to put your thoughts down on your paper is a good idea. Then your answer is given. and Your, ans your answer should be a paragraph or a brief verbal essay. It won't be as organized or perfect as an essay, of course, but it should be more than a few words or scattered thoughts, and it should definitely not just be one sentence long. And you may be asked questions by panelists for follow-up as well. Now, don't be surprised if you are or you aren't. It doesn't mean that something is bad, that you got questions or that you didn't get questions. It really is very different depending on each student and each question. Sometimes panelists don't need to ask anything because you've already you know, knocked the ball out of the park. Or sometimes they ask you something because you knocked the ball out of the park and they want to see if you can take it even a little bit further. So don't be focused on whether or not you got asked follow-up questions. That is not an indicator of whether you're doing well or not. One of the things I like to tell people is to utilize the model I call e-truck, which is a mnemonic to help them study and as a way of thinking about their answers. So e-truck is just a mnemonic. It's a guide and not a template. You don't want to sit there and treat your answers like a checklist because otherwise you'll sound too formulaic and programmed. You want to remain natural in your responses. But it is important to make sure that these things are included in your answers if possible. The ethics of the answer, and this is a good place usually to start. What are the principles that apply in this case and how do they guide your response? Teamwork, meaning who else might you need to involve? And that might mean people within your normal organizational team as well as people outside the team, lay people like family members or other professionals or supervisors or people from other agencies. Think about the resources, challenges, and strengths that you might have access to. Community access, um, school access within the school or program where you work, what kind of experts might be out there, uh, what might the individual themselves be able to bring to the table, what media out there exists, that sort of thing. And it's a really good idea for you to think about experiences you've had in real life and talk about them here from your practicum or volunteer work or even just your own personal life and think about how you might bring them into the equation. Think about the underlying psychology and behavior management ideas that you'd bring in. Things like the arousal cycle and positive programming ideas and pervasive approaches. And get into the how you're going to communicate. Get as specific as you can, thinking about what you'd actually say and do. And who would you say it to or write it to? And when would you do it? Get into the mechanics of it and go back and review models, modules such as communication skills and effective writing skills just as examples. Some of the common errors that people make. The first one is not as common as it used to be. People sometimes had sort of a false sense of security and underestimated what was involved and didn't study enough or they tried to cram in the last minute. Don't cram. Do lots of little bits of study and you'll usually be in good shape. Do take care of yourself along the way. Follow your medical procedures and your diet and your sleep needs as we've talked about. Don't forget as you're talking in scenarios that you're not being told that you're by yourself. People often make the assumption that they're by themselves and they forget to think about things like whether they might be able to call up a colleague or bring a member of the community into the scenario or deal with their supervisor. Don't just use terminologies. Make sure that you can explain any words that you use and be able to do more than just give us an example. Be able to define them. If you start to feel nervous, don't feel nervous about feeling nervous. It's okay to have a shaky hand or a sweaty upper lip. It's normal. Don't worry about it. Make a joke about it. Wipe your lip and move forward. Everybody in that room has had a similar experience. If you start worrying about your nervousness, then it'll get worse. Instead, slow down, take a few deep breaths, 
tell us out loud what you're feeling and we will give you a little bit of space or bring some humor into the scenario. And if something is working for you, keep doing it. It sounds strange, but I've seen students who are having really big success in the first few questions of the exam and you can sort of see them think to themselves, well, this is easier than I thought. And then they start kind of breezing through the last two or three questions. And because they weren't using the same structure and rigor that they used in the first few, the answers aren't as good. So if it's working, keep doing it. And if it's not working, slow yourself down and think about what you did in practice that worked for you there and make sure you bring it into the equation. Rushing is very bad. Slow down and do what works. How do I prepare? Well, the biggest thing is to study in a group. Choose groups that are going to work for you based on the size, the availability of people, but don't just pick partners that are easy to work with because they're like you or their schedule is similar. Pick people that will push you, that will complement you in areas where you're a little bit weaker. Don't go and study with a bunch of people who are equally challenged by the same material as you. Break down some of the things that you have to study more into a jigsaw. So if everybody's challenged by one subject, have the group break it down and teach it back. Go back and look at old readings and jigsaw those as well. Create questions for each other based on the model that I'm going to show you in the in-class session. And as you're reviewing those questions or practicing them, take note of the areas where people are struggling the most or where you're struggling the most to make a point to go back and focus on those areas for study. Don't just keep studying the things you're good at. When you're doing those questions, see if you can scaffold off each other. Ask more than one person in the group to answer. The first person answers, then the second person sees if they can take it further. And then the third person sees if they can improve on that answer even further. And that's how you'll gradually make your answers more complete and scaffolded. Typically, when people start off, they give answers that are very short. They don't know what else to say. But when they study in groups and hear other people contribute, it starts to kind of jar their thinking loose and get the creative creative juices flowing. Think about what questions you would need to ask of somebody in your group to get them to be more clear or what questions somebody might need to ask you. What would be the follow-up questions? And see if the next time you answer a question, you can include that information so that the question wouldn't be needed. Make sure that you're giving feedback to people that's honest throughout the process. If you give people honest feedback and they know they need to work on something, they'll do what we call front loading. They'll do all the work at the beginning of this process and gradually get better. But if you tell them that they're doing really, really well and they don't think they need to do that extra work, then they might find out too late in the process and find themselves having to scramble or cram. It's much better to tell people, hey, you need to work on something and then tell them when you're noticing progress. It's also very important to study under simulated test conditions. So think about this. You're not going to get questions in written form, so don't give written questions to your teammates. You're not going to get an hour or two or a 24-hour period to think things through. So ask the question and have the person actually process the information right there in your study session. In fact, when you're speaking in a study session in, the, in an exam, the panelists are simply going to be taking notes of what you say, and it's a really good practice for your classmates to simulate that process. Score the person using the plus two to minus two scale that I'm going to show you later in this video so they can really decide where they need to do better. So how are answers scored? Well, in the exam, they're scored from a score of zero to ten, but that can be a bit complicated for the practice sessions. So I'm going to convert it to a minus two to plus two score. Plus two is the best. How do these things work? Well, when a, when a panelist gives you a 9 or a 10, they're telling you that you're almost perfect, that the answer was expanded, almost like an essay, very organized and clear, and everything you said was accurate. That really showed that you understood and you were able to give both the definition and examples, that you were able to be innovative. In fact, you might have even said things that the panelists wouldn't have thought of, and that you didn't need them to ask a lot of clarifying questions to get it answered. And if they did ask you follow-up questions, they were probably challenging ones to see if you could go a little bit further and you handled those well. Now, don't expect to be at this level when you start off. That's not realistic. But ultimately, as you're working through the process, you want to try and get to this point where you're earning plus twos in the views of your classmates. So keep on pushing until you get there. It's called a plus two because it's far away from the borderline. 
you're really comfortably in the zone where you know that you've got this material down, you're going to pass, and it's just a function of whether or not you're going to pass by a little or by a lot. Passing by a little is a pretty comfortable place to be, and it's a realistic place to be. It's about an 8 or a low 9 on a judge's scorecard. These answers are complete, even if they don't necessarily have any creativity in them per se, and that's totally, totally fine. The person's really accurate, really clear, really convinces the panelists that they know what they're talking about. They can even give some examples, and they don't need very much prompting, but a little bit is okay. And if you're evaluating in your group, you might call this a plus one, and I suspect that most of the answers will be around this plus one area as you get close to the end of your practicing moving into some plus twos. But when you start off, a lot of you will be right on the borderline of a zero. This is the line where on a judge's scorecard, a six or a seven could be given. And we call it the borderline because if you got two sixes and a seven, you'd be at 19 and not a pass. But two sevens and a six would be a 20 and would be a pass. In martial arts, they say, don't leave it in the hands of the judges. And that's a really similar thought process here. We want to make sure that we're consistently answering in that area that your colleagues were calling a plus one or even a plus two. You're not leaving it up in the air. We don't want judges to not be able to tell whether you understood or have the ability to apply. So you might know the material, but you haven't convinced the panelists when you answer with this type of a score. You had difficulty explaining the answer if you earned this score, and you couldn't put it in your own words. Often when people are asked to define something, they say they can't, but they can give an example or two. Their answers often don't go any deeper. They just keep saying the same things over and over again, even after a prompt. And so that's an area where the judges often struggle. If you're in a failing area on a court, in a judge's card, you either got a four or a five, meaning that your response wasn't showing us enough. That's the biggest area here is people don't give us enough. They have incomplete answers and they get in that four to five area. The person might know some of the terminology or vocabulary, but they can't really explain it. They can't really apply it. Their answers are broad, but they're shallow. They can't go deep enough to show us they could actually do it. And there may be follow-up questions. The panelist might want to find out if that was something that just happened on the one question or whether your knowledge is an issue across the board. They might ask you a similar question. And a score of 0 to 3 or a minus 2 in your practice sessions is an answer that's the opposite or, or plain simply wrong. It's not just incomplete, but the person has said something that might be troublingly wrong. They might have said something that's unethical or something that goes against our established practice. So, for example, we've had people say things that were unsafe or they fundamentally didn't know what to do when they were encountering a situation that was unethical. This is often a person who simply says, I don't know, I have no idea, or can I guess? And again, they may get asked questions that have a similar topic area by the panelists later in the exam. So it's really important not to have these kind of gaps. We're going to spend time in the practice session in class on this next thing and break it down, but students often need some help in terms of how to formulate practice questions. The questions that they create often focus on the client, and client scenarios are absolutely realistic, but they're not the only type of scenario you might have. You might have scenarios that ask you what to do when you're challenged by something with a colleague, for example, a conflict or somebody whose behavior is unethical. Or what about a parent that's got some challenge or struggle, a parent that might be demanding of you? What about questions that ask you to apply or interpret ethics similar to the ones we had in our advanced behavior, advanced ethics course? Or scenarios that ask you to apply planning skills such as in our program planning module, our service planning module, or in modules that were around how do we navigate with um, things like write, written documents and so forth. Also crisis management, what do we do in first aid scenarios uh, behavior where there's acting out behaviors, dangerous behaviors, and that sort of thing. Also best practice, specific skill sets. How do we actually navigate certain things? For example, how would you write certain types of documents? It's just an example. And then general knowledge where you might be asked to really kind of tell us everything you know about a particular topic. For example, a diagnosis or the type of medication or a model that we broadly apply often in our course. So we'll give you some examples of that when we get together in person. 
but for now that gives you a bit of a heading on some of the types of questions you might expect. And to wrap up, a few last words for you. As you begin to do the preparation process, it will be very likely that you will find yourself being more challenged than you might expect. That's normal. If this was an easy process, we wouldn't do it. The whole idea is to have the student be under a degree of some pressure or rigor that makes them more polished and more ready when they leave the course. So everybody needs to study and practice. Nobody goes into this process scoring plus twos on all of the questions at the beginning. So expect to be challenged at first. Expect to stink a little bit, but expect to get better as well. In fact, keep a journal or a tracking sheet so you can actually see your progress. Not only will you get better at the material, but you'll feel more confident and less nervous as you can come into the room for the exam. And remember, you got this far in the course and that represents a real thing. You didn't get here by chance. Getting to do your panel exam is a milestone and it represents that you've done a lot of other things effectively on the way. So this is your moment to shine. Panelists are going to be there to support you. We're not there to trick you or surprise you. We're there to witness your moment of greatness. And remember that everybody else that's done it before you experienced similar challenges. Whatever you're going into this with, there's somebody else who's had it. They're the same age, they were the same gender, they were the same, struggled with the same material, mental health issues, physical health issues, you name it, people have gone through it. And they got through it. They had the same challenges as you and they succeeded. If they can do it, then you need to realize two things. It can be done and it's often done. And all you need to do is follow the steps that we've talked about and you can do it as well. So you have my full faith in you. And if along the way you need any help at all, don't hesitate to ask because it's my job to help you be successful in this process. All right. Hopefully this has been helpful. Good luck and happy hunting.